Okay, thanks, Greg. And hello, everybody. And uh, I'm Bruce Thompson. I assume y'all can hear me. Yep. And um, I would like to introduce myself. I'm a semi-retired uh, professor in civil construction environmental engineering. I started at UNM in the late Pleistocene. I was 12 years old. Um, Carrie Howe is uh, director. He's also a professor. He's director of the Center for Water in the Environment. Um, and uh, just to like to toot his horn just a little bit, he just was uh, awarded, I believe, the award of distinguished professor at UNM. And a couple of weeks ago, he was given award, national award from the American Membrane Technology uh, Association. So uh, yeah, it's very, we've been collaborating on this and other things for a long time. And it's, it's, it's great to have him here. So what are our, uh, we are both environmental engineers involved in water treatment, wastewater treatment, water resources, and things like that. Um, and as I said in this slide, there's a lot of interest in brackish water resources, particularly in arid parts of the country. And uh, the idea is that it is a new source. It's not been used. We've not used brackish water before because uh, it's expensive to desalinate. And so our technology is looking to improve the desalination process through a pretreatment process. And when I talk about brackish water, I'm talking about things that are uh, about from a, a fresh water to something that's maybe one third, maybe one half the salinity of seawater. Seawater is about 35,000 milligrams per liter or parts per million. And our technology is applicable up to into waters that are perhaps 10 to uh, 15,000. So hey, here's a map. Bruce, this... sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I don't see your slides up. Do you, oh, you want to sh hit share your screen? I am sorry. That's okay. So right in the middle of the Zoom, there should be something that shows, there you go. I am sorry. I've never done that before, at least not today. And they're a little, okay, now they're on center. Okay. So again, that's, that's me and there's Carrie. I see his picture now and I, I apologize. I just got off another hour and a half Zoom meeting and so I'm a little bit fried. Again, I'm talking about brackish water and here is my, the range, brackish water is something from a little bit saltier than fresh water to uh, up to maybe half or a third the salinity of seawater. Here's a map of the brackish water resources of New Mexico. These are groundwater sources and you can see they're all over the state. We don't use them at present again because um, it, it's more expensive than freshwater resources, but as we run out of freshwater supplies, we increasingly look to uh, the brackish water resources. Um, I would point out the map kind of uh, ends down here at El Paso, but El Paso has got a large brackish water desalination plant and will uh, it draws from the water in the Tularosa Basin. And we'll talk about that in a second. So when you go to desalination, there are two uh, variations uh, on or two methods that are commonly used. There's some other ones that are less commonly used, but the two, the two principal processes are thermal processes, which are variations of distillation where you convert the liquid to a vapor. It leaves the salts behind, then you condense the vapor and uh, you've got distilled water or something approaching that. And then the membrane processes, and I suspect most folks are familiar with reverse osmosis, which is where you force the water under pressure through a semi-permeable membrane. The water molecules pass through the membrane, the salts and, and uh, organics and other constituents uh, stay behind. The one of the most important measures of performance of any desalination process is the feed water recovery. And this is the fraction of water 
that is recovered for subsequent use. So if you have 50% recovery, you put in 100 gallons and you recover 50 gallons of distilled water and you have 50 gallons of concentrate. This is the waste stream that um, contains all the dissolved constituents, the dissolved solids, and they're removed from solution. They're referred to as concentrate or brine. So here is a picture of the K. Bailey Hutchison plant in El Paso, Texas. And you can see it's got row after row after row of these, of these um, uh, tubes. I think they're four inches in diameter and they have reverse osmosis membranes in them. And uh, this plant treats water with a salinity of about 3000 milligrams per liter, about one tenth the salinity of seawater. And they get about 75% recovery. So they feed in 100 gallons, recover 75 gallons of distilled water or deionized water and they have about 25 gallons of concentrate that they have to dispose of. So the challenges of an inland brackish water desalination process are quite a bit different than they are for a coastal seawater desalination process. The first one is that there is a finite brackish water resource. It's not recharged. And so we want to maximize feed water recovery. Again, K. Bailey Hutchinson recovers 75%, but they waste 25%. On the coast, it doesn't matter because seawater is essentially limitless. And uh, so there they may design for 40 or 50% recovery, but it, that, they're, they're not limited by their supply. The second major bullet is that um, you get scale formation on these on the surfaces, whether it's a membrane surface or a heat exchange surface. Um, as you concentrate the salts, you can get these precipitates that form, which requires increased cleaning of the membrane or heat exchanger surface, reduces the performance, and reduces the feed water recovery. And again, it's not such a problem with seawater for two reasons. One is we don't need to achieve maximum recovery, but the other is seawater is 95% sodium chloride, which doesn't have significant scale recovery. And the last one, again, uh, unique to inland desal processes is concentrate disposal. If you're on the coast and you have a concentrate stream, usually you can just dump it back into the seawater, into the ocean. You may have to have diffusers so you distribute it so it doesn't impact. You don't have local salinity gradients that impact marine life, but you, the, the common way of dealing with concentrate on the coast is to return it to the sea. We don't do that in, in the inland desal processes. Um, for the large inland desalination facilities, uh, concentrate disposal is usually by deep well injection. So in El Paso, for example, they pipe their concentrate 22 miles to an uh, injection well field, and, uh, and that's how they dispose of it. Um, it is expensive. There was a design study done for a desal plant in Sandoval County, west of Rio Rancho, if you're familiar. And the, the construction costs and the piping and injection and, and uh, concentrate management costs was gonna be 50% of the total cost of the treated water. So our technology has the goal of reducing those concentrate management issues by recovering commodity minerals. So this would be magnesium hydroxide and gypsum. This would allow us to increase the feed water recovery. And most importantly, and this is really where the benefit is, is that it would reduce the mass and the volume of the concentrate that requires disposal. 
Um, it is based on a research project we had from DOE National Energy Technology Laboratory. Um, I think it was funded in 2016 or 17, and we finished it in 2018 or 19. Um, and it was to treat wastewater from flue gas desulfurization process. Flue gas desulfurization is a process where they remove SO2 from the stack gas of coal-fired power plants to prevent acid range, acid rain. We had uh, two master's students that worked on this. They were both, it was interesting, they were both from Nepal and they were just terrific students, delightful young, young men. Um, Ayush Shahi is now a PhD student at University of Colorado and Sugam is now in the consulting business. We also had a, a postdoctoral researcher who joined us late in the project, and I believe he's on the on the uh, the call here, and that's Odell Lee, and he is continuing on uh, as a postdoctoral researcher with the Center for Water and the Environment. He's working on this project as well. So here's here's the process. The first step involves degasification. And degasification, the purpose is to remove dissolved CO2. Does, if we have CO2 in the water, um, it limits the purity of the minerals that we can recover. So the first step is degasification. Then we raise the pH to about 11, 10 and a half or 11, and we can recover high purity magnesium hydroxide. It's a commodity mineral. Um, it is used in, in uh, some processes. It's used in uh, cement. It's used in uh, soil amendments and things like that. It's a low value commodity mineral, but by separating it from the, the saline water, the brackish water, we've reduced the volume. The next one is a cation exchange process right here. And this is exactly the same is your home ion exchange water softener. It also removes calcium, but it also removes magnesium and iron and anything else you might have. So by we've removed the magnesium, so the only thing left is the calcium. Then it goes from there to a nanofiltration process, which is similar to, um, in some respects, to reverse osmosis, but it will separate, selectively recover sulfate. So now we've got a waste stream that contains calcium. We've got another waste stream that contains sulfate. We combine those and it um, precipitates gypsum. And there's a SEM um, image of gypsum particles, a real pretty flat, uh, the mineral, uh, yeah, mineral phase is a very high purity. Gypsum is used in wallboard. There's a gypsum plant up by Bernalillo. It's used as a soil amendment and so forth. And then the pretreated water can be removed by any desalination process. So here's the advantage of the MRED process. This is for a 500,000 gallon per day uh, brackish water feed. And so here is the K. Bailey Hutchinson plant, again, 500,000 gallons per day, influent TDS is around uh, 3,000 milligrams per liter. We reduce something on the order of 270 kilograms of magnesium hydroxide, 42 cubic meters per day. We reduce, we, we recover 309 kilograms per day of gypsum. And instead of recovering 75% of the feed water as is done at present, we're gonna bump it up to over 90%. Um, again, there's a, a, a Bureau of Reclamation uh, demonstration facility in Alamogordo. We think that we can recover 85% of the water. And again, a lot of gypsum, a lot of magnesium hydroxide. And then the last one is the flue gas desulfurization from a coal fired power plant. In addition to these uh, commodity minerals, this plant will also reduce 
of this process will reduce trace contaminants, including aluminum, iron, magnes, uh, mercury, lead, selenium, and silica. Applications of the process, um, it will work on any hard brackish water. Hardness is water that has calcium and or magnesium, and it will improve the performance of the desalination process and reduce the concentrate disposal costs. It would be applicable to any large coal-fired, I'm sorry, in a, a brackish industrial wastewater treatment plant, such as coal-fired power plants, cooling water blowdown, where you have uh, cooling water is recirculated and the, um, the dissolved salts increase. It would be applicable to any inland brackish groundwater desalination plant, such as uh, El Paso. Uh, it would be applicable if you had uh, per direct potable reuse of municipal wastewater, where the uh, domestic water cycle increased the salinity to the point of where you would uh, consider desalination. So the two examples, there is a plant in Cloudcroft, New Mexico, that is very close to starting up. There is an operating plant, plant <clears throat> operating treatment plant, a deep, direct potable reuse plant in Big Spring, Texas, out in West Texas, uh, that uses reverse osmosis. And it could be used in uh, mine and mill tailings wastewater, such as from a uh, copper mine or something like that. Market potential. Um, we have had conversations with manufacturers of reverse osmosis equipment. And uh, this is a big multinational, in fact, international company. Um, they say, prove it. And I'll get to that in one moment. We've talked to a couple different coal-fired power plant uh, operators. They will pull the trigger on this if EPA implements new treatment standards for the flue gas desulfurization wastewater. And we've had conversations with a government agency which has a um, high salinity irrigation return flow out in uh, Southern Central California. And then we've talked to a number of uh, small marketing companies and some consulting engineers. The next step is that we were recently awarded a $150,000 project from the Bureau of Reclamation to design and build a one gallon pilot demonstration plant. And this is, we got the funding about the 1st of July. And so we're starting work on that. Um, we will test this, part of the contract was that we will test this at the Brackish Groundwater National Desalination Research Facility. <laughs> I think I got that right. Bigendorf in Alamogordo. Uh, hopefully the testing will begin uh, next summer. And that, again, this one gallon per minute pilot plant is what the reverse osmosis manufacturing company wants to see and then we filed a patent through STC. My references to some of the work that we've published is there. Um, and with that, I will, I will uh, stop uh, the presentation and take any questions that anybody might have. And before I do that, I would allow Carrie, my uh, co-conspirator, to, uh, to uh, offer any uh, uh, comments that he might have on this. Nope, I don't have anything to add. Okay. I have a question. Um, so how much of the potential market for this technology is coal plants? And are you concerned that as we move to green energy, we move away, from, hopefully we move away from coal, yeah. if that would be problematic? Yeah. So in, in, in the research, and it's in this flue gas desulfurization technology there, I, I don't remember the exact numbers. There's about 300 coal plants that um, practice flue gas desulfurization technology. And of course the market for coal is falling, you know, every, every year. 
Um, the big coal plant in New Mexico is the San Juan generating station up there in, in uh, near Four Corners area. And they expect to close that within the year, if not sooner. So I, I, the, the market for this, for coal-fired applications, depends on EPA. EPA has proposed regulations that would require them to treat their flue gas desulfurization wastewater separate from their cooling water. And if they do that, I think there's a pretty good market for this.